All right, we're going to get into our, our message this morning. Uh, we're talking about, I, I think our theme for this year as a church is going to be rooted to grow. Rooted to grow deep and wide. Luke eight fifteen says, And the seed that fell on the good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. The seed that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. As we um, go through life, man, it's so easy to focus on the fruit, but this year we want to take some time to just really focus on the roots and just say, like, man, we just, I just want to grow in Christ this year. And, and we're really excited to be able to do that. And in order to do that, we're going to cling to God. We're going to cling tight to God. I want to read another verse that I'm not going to put up on the screen. It's Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Man, let your, you accepted Christ, now let your roots grow down into him, that your lives will be built on him. And that's what we want to do this year. We want to grow our roots uh, into Christ. We want to be the church that's growing in our relationship with him, and we know that when a tree grows, that it, when its roots are strong, then its, its fruit will be strong. And I showed this, this is just for those of you that weren't here last week. Um, this is a picture of a little immature tree. And I, I told a story last week of, I'll tell the really short version of it this week. Uh, at, at, in doing land surveying, a lot of times we would track trees as property lines when there was no actual boundary marks that couldn't be determined, and the barbed wire would be an indicator of a property line. Um, it was not the best indicator, but sometimes it was the only indicator. And the barbed wire, we were looking for a 100-year-old property line, and there was no description of it. So we went, and there was a forester with us, property owners and surveyors, and we went and walked this property line, and I found a massive tree, and the barbed wire was deep into the tree, and then I found a small tree like this, even a little bit smaller than this tree, because this is just off Google Images. And the small tree like this, and the barbed wire was right dead in the center of it. And I thought, how could this be? That this giant tree, the barbed wire is way deep into it, which means it's, this tree has grown a lot since that barbed wire was put in it. And then this small tree, like how could that be that that's the same type of barbed wire? And the forester said, it's simple, these trees are the same age. But because this tree was in the shadow of that tree, it never grew. And, and so much of life is, is that we, we hide. We hide from our trials. We hide from our, 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 our opportunities to grow. And, and we want to step out this year. We want to say, God, I want to grow in you. I want to grow mature. I don't want to just hide in the shadow of somebody else. I want to, I want to grow. And so we're going to be looking at some of the, the most important truths of our faith this year. And um, so we're, we're actually doing this Powerfield Basics of the Christian Faith class in sermon form on Sunday mornings for the next handful of weeks. And today we're doing lesson two, uh, knowing Jesus. And so if you're online with us, um, you can go to Ashford Church backslash courses and actually download the entire series of lesson notes and you can do that here too if you want to, but there's a handout in your bulletin that is the extremely abbreviated notes, so it's just one two-sided page if you want to fill in the blanks um, this morning. Uh, but we're excited to do this, and this topic, knowing Jesus, is uh, it, it, the idea of summarizing who is Jesus in one sermon is really not that easy. And so uh, we're not going to cover it all today, but we're going to cover some really good and important, um, important stuff. Now, uh, what we want to do as we go through this series is we want to make sure that we're growing deep in, in knowledge, in education, but 
the secret of Christian faith is not education. It's that the Word transforms us. And in order for that transformation to take place, we have to have application. So we're going to move from education to application to transformation. And so every lesson is going to focus on all three of those um, in a pattern that would move us in that direction of transformation. Okay, so who is, who is Jesus? Tried to summarize this into one paragraph. It's a super basic summary. It doesn't have enough in it, but in order to get it just into one short statement, um, this is my summary that I wrote. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He was born of a virgin and is both fully God and fully human. He is the second part of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His, name, his personal name, Jesus, means Savior, and his title, Christ, means anointed one. He is the anointed one of God to save mankind through his life, death, and resurrection. And so again, that's, uh, that's oversimplifying, but it's trying to really grab the heart and the richness of who, who Jesus is. Now, regardless of what you believe about Jesus, Jesus is undoubtedly the most famous person who ever lived. There's more written about Jesus, more people that know Jesus than anyone who ever lived, the most famous um, person that ever lived, and no one doubts that he lived. No one doubts that he was an actual person that lived. No one doubts the time frame that he lived. There's historical evidence for his life that is so extensive that no one could ever, ever challenge that or question that in any way. The question is, who was he? The question is, who was he? So we're going to look at that today. The first fill in, your, fill in your blank is this. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Jesus was fully God and fully man. First verse we're going to look at real quick is from uh, Matthew 1, 20 and 21. It says, as he considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, he said, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus had to be fully man to pay for our sin debt, but he had to be fully God in order to be born a sinner without original sin. And so it was necessary that he was born and that he was fully man. He was born of a virgin, and yet he was conceived by God. Luke 1, 34 and 35, Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? How can this happen? I'm a virgin. But the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the baby will be, the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. God. So he was uh, born of a virgin, conceived by God. So he was God. He was fully man, born of a woman, conceived by God, so he was fully God. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. And so he was in the beginning. Everything was made through Jesus. Jesus was always there. He was, it says he was with God, and he was God. And then verse 14 says, So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So he was fully God and fully man. He became human. He was there in the very beginning, but he had his first human existence when he was born of a virgin and born of Mary. So he was this is just so important for us to note because this is what the Bible teaches and this is what people have trouble believing. But he was fully God and he was uh, fully man. 
We also know him as the Son of God, as the Son of God. Jesus Christ is God's Son. So he was born a human, but he wasn't just born on his own. He was born as the Son of God. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 says, Long ago God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Now in these final days he has spoken to us through his Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, He created the universe. The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses His very, the very character of God. And He sustains everything by His mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us of our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels just as the name of God gave him greater, gave him, the name God gave him is greater than their names. And so the Bible tells us that uh, Jesus is God's son, and he has spoken to us through his son in these last days. So the Bible just has so much to say about him being fully God and fully man living on this earth. And so um, as we work on answering this question, who is Jesus, we see what the Bible says about him and about his birth and who he was going to be. So let's now look at a few verses that, uh, that, um, where Jesus says who he is. So these are verses that God said about him and who he was going to be. But now we're going to look at a few verses uh, that tell us who Jesus claimed to be himself. The next fill in the blank is Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus wasn't just a great guy on earth. He claimed to be God. John 10, 30 says, The Father and I are one. That picture of unity, of the Trinity, of Him being God. Um, the Father and I are one. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill Him. And Jesus said, at my Father's direction, I have done many good works. For which of these are you going to stone me? They replied, we're stoning you not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. See, people didn't have a problem with what Jesus did and the miracles he worked and those amazing things. That was fine. That wasn't intimidating. That wasn't insulting. But when he claimed to be God... That's what made the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law, that's what made the people say, man, you are, you're, you're, you're committing blasphemy against the Old Testament, um, blasphemy against God. He claimed to be God. And eventually this was the only thing that they were able to bring um, before Pilate. This ultimately was the thing that got Jesus crucified, was not anything that he accomplished, not even because he healed on the Sabbath, but because he claimed to be God. And so when he claimed to be God, this is when they, they got upset about him. And this is the same thing we face today as Christians. If you say God, nobody really gets offended when you say God. Now, in last week's lesson, we said we know his name. We know his name. And when you start to define who God is and know his name, people might get offended, but people are really happy with the generic term God. It's almost like all-inclusive, and anybody can just say the word God. You can get away with saying the word God almost all day long. But when you start to talk about Jesus, you talk about exclusive claims. You talk about exclusive claims. And Jesus was claiming to be God, and his exclusive claims were going to be the things that started messing with the people that day and the same things that mess with the people in the world. So it's really important for us to know what are those exclusive claims. And this is the next fill in the blank. Jesus claimed to be the only way of salvation. Jesus claimed to be the only way of salvation. Now, you, people could, be save, could save somebody from, you know, a bill. They could save somebody from getting run over by a horse. They could save somebody from different unique things. But the salvation that Jesus brought was spiritual and eternal. And it wasn't just saving somebody from a situation. It was saving them for all eternity. John 14, 6 and 7 says, Jesus told him, he was talking to his disciples, and this is in the context of he was going away to heaven, and he was promising that he was going to come again one day. They were confused. They didn't know 
What is he talking about? And this is what Jesus said to them. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus claimed to be the only way of salvation. That if you reject him, you just can't get to heaven. There's no other way. This is a claim that is extremely offensive to people in the world today. But this is Jesus' great claim. And here's the thing. If he's right, you want to know. Now, we easily buy into this idea that all roads are equal. This is the way the world kind of speaks to us today. But if it was summertime and I wanted to grab myself a chili cheese dog at the Ashford Dairy Bar, and I came out this driveway right here, I can't turn either way to get there. If I turn right and start going that way, I am not going to end up at the dairy bar ever unless I, at some point, recalculate. You just, it's not going to happen. There's not, it's, but if I turn a left out of here, then I'll get there, right? All roads are not equal. All, all gods are not the same. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I am God. And then he started helping us understand that there's an exclusive way to get to God. And he said, the only way you can get to him is to believe in his son. And he said, I am the way. So, I don't think the devil wants this message heard this morning. Because what if you didn't know the way? Would you want to just have to try every way that existed? You know, like you ever get caught in a maze? Anybody ever do those big corn mazes that take a couple hours to get through? I haven't. I don't know. I'm not doing that, right? Um, I don't want to go through a maze where I'm stuck and can't find the way. And so Jesus said, like, you don't have, you're not stuck in an eternal maze. Man, I'm going to tell you the way. I am the way. Rachel always says, if we ever get divorced, it's going to be over driving directions. Man, we have our worst fights in the car when we're trying to get somewhere. Anybody else that way? Any other? Uh, man, you and your spouse, you are at your worst in the car trying to get somewhere, right? So, man, we need to know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, and I'm the only way. I'm the only way. So, his, Jesus' instruction is here. If you've turned the wrong way, it's time to recalculate. It's time to change your direction. In the Bible, we call that repent. Repent and make a 180 in your belief. Make a 180 in the direction you're going. And come to him. The next thing Jesus claimed was, he claimed to forgive sin. He claimed to forgive sin. Mark 2, 5, it says, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. If we went on in the passage, they question him and say, this is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And he says, so that you understand that I can also uh, forgive sins. Let me show you this. I can heal this man. And he heals the man. And he gets up. He says, get up and pick up your mat and go home. And so Jesus does miracles to prove that he has the right to forgive sin. He did these amazing miracles, but the miracles were for the message. And the message was for salvation. He, they could be forgiven of sins, that they could be made right with God, that they could be saved from their eternal punishment in hell and enter into paradise with God because Jesus had taken the sin debt from them. And so Jesus made this outrageous claim that he could forgive sins. Again, they said, this is absolute blasphemy. Who can forgive somebody from their sins? Well, since Jesus was God, the sin was against him. And so he was able to come and take that sin, pay for our sin on the cross, which is absolutely amazing. He had some outrageous claims. So we're trying to come back to this question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus in this lesson? We said no one can argue the fact that he existed, but people argue about his claims. He claimed to be God. He claimed to be the only way of salvation. He claimed to be able to forgive sin. People have a problem with this. They can't argue that he existed, but they argue against his claims. 
when you ask people who is Jesus, the most popular answer is probably, um, is probably this, that he was a good man. Man, I hear that over and over again when I have conversations with people. You know, who do you think Jesus is? And usually skeptics will say, he was a good man. He was a good man. And uh, that's possibly even a more popular answer than people saying he was the Son of God. He was our Savior. Um, But it's the answer that is completely void of logic and common sense, and I want to point that out to you and help you understand why today, because the most popular answers are not, don't always hold any, any validity. According to C.S. Lewis, um, he is one of three things. He is either liar, lunatic, or Lord. He cannot be considered a good man. He cannot be considered a good man. C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, writes this. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus Christ. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, they say, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something else. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. The Bible tells us that Jesus was not just a man. He was the Christ or the coming Messiah the anointed one who would save the world from their sins. And he decided that he could prove it. He proved it by doing all these things that regular people couldn't do. Do men heal the blind? No, but Jesus did. Do men raise the dead? No, but Jesus did. Do men turn water into wine? No, but Jesus did. Do men calm the storm with a command? No, but Jesus did. Do men take one lunch and feed 5,000 people with it? No, but Jesus did. Do good men rise from the dead? No, but Jesus did. Do good men claim to be God? No, only lunatics do unless they're actually God, which is why Jesus claimed it. Do men claim to be able to forgive your sins against God? Only a liar would do that, unless he actually was God. See, most people resolve to call Jesus a good man because it's a safe answer, but it's an answer that will get you nowhere. He showed love, so they call him a good man. He showed mercy, so they called him a good man. He tur- turned the world upside down with kindness, so they called him a good man. He cared for the outcasts, so they called him a good man. He taught good moral values, so they called him a good man. But he claimed to be God. Now the answer, a good man, doesn't work. Do good people claim to be God? No, only liars or lunatics would do that. Was Jesus a lunatic? Or was he God? If Jesus claimed to be God and really believed and really believed it, but he wasn't, he would be a lunatic. He would think he was something that he wasn't. If he didn't believe that he was God, but he claimed it, then he would be a liar, trying to deceive people. But if he claimed it and it was true, if he claimed that he was God, that he could forgive sins. If he claimed that he was the only way of salvation, and it was true, then he really is God, 
which makes Him our Lord. He told people that if they believe in Him, that He would forgive their sins and save them from hell. Do good people do that? If I did that today, if I promised you that today, you should leave this church right away because that wouldn't, I would not be one to follow. We generally don't call liars good people. We generally don't call lunatics good people. We generally don't call deceivers good people. Here's the bottom line. It is impossible for Jesus to have been a good man. Impossible. His claims don't fit the bill for a good man because he claimed to be God. He claimed to forgive sins. He claimed to offer eternal life. A portion of that quote from C.S. Lewis again. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. Let us not come to any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. The fact is that based upon Jesus' claims, he can't be a good man, a moral teacher, because moral teachers don't lie and mere men don't rise from the dead. So we have to decide who is he. Mark Hopkins in his uh, book of lectures on the evidence of Christianity in 1846 said, Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud or he himself deluded, um, deluded and self-deceived or he was divine. There is no getting out of this trilemma. It is inexorable. So here's the bottom line. You have to make this choice. You have to make this choice. Each one of us has to say, what am I going to do with this? I have to make this choice. Is Jesus a liar? I have to make the choice. Is Jesus a lunatic? Or is he Lord and God? What am I going to believe? What am I going to believe? Because he hasn't left the options open to good man. Helpful a good club to be a part of. It's not on the table. So people have been taking forever to make this decision, and thousands of years have passed. But to help us make this decision today, I want to just go back to the discussion the disciples had with Jesus before he went to the cross. Jesus actually after a couple years of ministry, he came up to them and he said, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? They answered the safe questions and said, talked about what people said he was, and he said, no, no, who do you say I am? And um, Simon Peter answered in Matthew 16, uh, 15, 16, 16, he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah, the Son of... Even Jesus was with his disciples, and they saw all the miracles. And he said, what's your decision going to be? Other people's answers were a good man and a great prophet. Elijah, John the Baptist, whatever. The people were trying to get that answer, just letting him be a prophet or somebody special. Jesus said, who are you going to say I am? And his disciples, the closest people to him, the ones walking every day, the ones that knew the secrets that happened in the back, background, the ones who knew when he went to the bathroom, when he ate his meals, the ones who knew everything about him, when they had to come up with this answer, they're like, no, he's not deceiving anybody. Here's the answer. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They got that answer right. There was one disciple who was sort of the last one to get this question right. Thomas wasn't there when the resurrection happened. And after the resurrection happened, everybody said we saw him resurrected, and he wasn't there. But then when he saw Jesus after the resurrection, he got this right, and he said, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Who is Jesus? Who do you say he is? To call him Lord and God is that he's the creator of my life. He's my creator from the very beginning that he always existed. To call him Lord is to say he's the one I take my commands from. He's the one who rules over my life. I choose to be his subject. I say you are my all in all. 
I humble myself, and I bow before you. We talked about um, what we know about him. We talked about uh, who he called himself, who God called him. Um, we talked about the fact that you can't, um, you can't, you know, uh, you can't get around this. We have to answer this question: Who is he to you? And I say today, the most important answer you'll ever get is not what church I join, not what my favorite song is. Honestly, the most important decision you'll make in your life isn't even who you marry. The most important decision you'll ever make in your life is how you answer this question. Is he a good man? Well, let's take that one off the table. Is he a liar and a waste of my time? Is he a lunatic and he's crazy? His decisions are too, his teachings are too hard to follow, too, too, too crazy. Or is he going to be my Lord, the one that I bow my knee before my Lord and my God. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And this is how we want to get this answer today. So here's the PowerPoint of the lesson. If you get this question right, if you get this question right, he wants you to know that he calls you family and friend, fill in the blanks. He calls you family and friend. Today, if you want to ask him to be your Lord and Savior, Man, you just do that. You say, I, I no longer believe that you're just a good man. I can't do that anymore. It's time for me to make this decision. I give my life to you. If that's you today, just go ahead and write your name on that line because he forgives you of your sin and he wants to welcome you no longer as a stranger, no longer as a mysterious good moral teacher, but he wants to welcome you into his family as his family and as his friend. He calls you family. Mark, uh, John, um, John 1, 12 says, but those who received, believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. Jesus died for our sins so that we could be adopted into his family, so that he could call us his family. And then he calls you his friend. John 15, 12 through 17 says, This is my command, love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because uh, a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. He says, I am your Lord, but I no longer uh, call you slaves. I call you friends. Jesus went to the cross so that you could have him as a friend. Man, it's so easy to feel alone in this world. When people reject you, when people abandon you, when you're up against tasks that are beyond your control. And we could have talked about Jesus the healer and Jesus all the other things today. But the one that I wanted to talk about as the PowerPoint of this message is that Jesus wants you to know him as his friend. He adopted you into his family so you could have a personal relationship with him. That's why he went to the cross. So you wouldn't be separated. So you wouldn't be distant. That he wouldn't be untouchable. He wants you to be his friend. Friends talk. Friends hang out. Friends can ask things out of one another. Here's what I want you to do this week. And if you're not a part of the class, you're still getting homework. This is what I want you to do this week. And I want you to just call it this. I want you to call it this. Man, I want you to schedule some hangout time with Jesus. Some hangouts, not whatever your regular devotion is, whatever all that is, not then. I want you to schedule a hangout time with Jesus. I don't care how long it is or what you do, whether you go for a walk or whether you just, you know, have coffee, have a coffee date with him or something like that. Man, schedule some hangout time with Jesus because we got to get this friend thing right because something special happens when we not only just call him. Lord, because that's where your salvation comes when we confess and we call him Lord. 
But man, transformed life comes when we call him friend. And we say, man, Jesus is not untouchable, unapproachable. Man, I, I love him. I hang out with him. I talk with him. I, I think with him. And, and in order for that to happen, it requires time. And so make an appointment this week. Make some hangout time with Jesus this week. And uh, talk out loud, man. Go to, go to a place, if you can, where you can just talk out loud so people don't think you're that lunatic for believing in him, you know, or whatever. So, all right, let's close in prayer. The band can come up. God, thank you for this morning and for being here with us. And, man, as we think about these deep truths, as we think about getting our root system right, we know that the only way we can have hope is to get these answers right. And so many churches, so many people that call themselves Christians today don't get this answer right. They don't know Jesus as they don't know Jesus as Lord. They just know him as a good man, a moral teacher. But God, you want us to know you as Lord, as family, and as friend. And I pray that we would get this right. That we would not forget how powerful you are, that you are the Son of God, that you are God Himself, but that you're not impersonal. You're our friend, and we can walk through life with you. Lord, help us make a great jump in this direction of just making sure that we give time to that friendship. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.